The September 17th meeting of the City Council Committee of the Whole review of 2019 to 23 capital improvements program and 2019 capital borrowing. Will the clerk please call the roll? Alder Spate? Here. Alder Wood? Here. Alder Kitzler? Here. Alder Coor? Here. Alder Grupe? Here. Mayor O'Connor? Here. Alder Moore is excused. Okay. Uh, for Alder Groupie, who hasn't gone through this delightful experience before, um, this is basically each department head comes and makes a presentation about what their capital budget request is. Okay. So they each get a period of time where they can do that and we can ask questions or whatever. Um, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask further questions when it's actually on the agenda to be approved, which will be in October. Okay. So we're going to do several of the shorter ones tonight and then on Monday we're going to be, I think we've got four or five, Mark? Correct. Others, that, including the longer ones, public well, works and parks and whatever. So first of all, Mark will do a overview for us and I think everybody got the handout of his slides. I'd like to follow along. I guess Jake isn't interested in that, huh? No. Okay. We'll just go ahead and start. All right. Um, so we'll start here in the capital budget. Um, before we get started, you know, what we were looking at when we sat down, I sat, sat down with the mayor and kind of figured out what our goals was. Um, one of the goals is, you know, there's the long range facility. You know, one of the goals is we've been talking the last couple of years here is public safety building and then the uh, eventually a future uh, community center, senior center building. Um, so let's, when we looked at that, that was one of our things is what we can we do to, you know, to afford that um, with our, you know, debt limits. So one of the things we asked um, each department head, each, um, is what we were trying to goal was to get to $2 million, excluding Bridge Road, because we knew we had that was kind of required to do um, with going with, with the TIF project and any TIF costs that was involved. So uh, I do have a slide in here. We do get to that amount. We basically get to, uh, once we subtract everything out, um, the bridge road and the TIF costs, we get close to the two, a little less than $2.1 million. So we did hit our goal um, to get to that amount um, with the, non, the non-TIF and non-bridge road amount. So that was one of our goals. Um, so we did hit that. The reason why, you know, like I said, we just want to make sure we got enough capacity eventually if we're going to do a public safety building is to hit that. So that was our goal. Um, and there's ways we're, we'll get into detail how we got to that goal. There was, you know, things we had to we cut um, to make that goal. And we did have to add some stuff in there um, too. There was stuff added in there too for other projects, but we did get close to that amount. Uh, so I don't, if everybody's familiar, there is a, what they call a debt limit. Um, each municipality falls under the same rule. You're only, you're only allowed to borrow up to 5% of your equalized value. Um, so our equalized value, the spreadsheet shows, is 1.1 million, 1,326,599,300 is what our equalized value is. So we're allowed to spend, we're allowed to borrow up to 5% of that. That amount is equivalent to sixty-six million three hundred twenty-nine thousand nine hundred sixty-five. Um, a little long. Our turn, a total outstanding debt um, projected as a twelve thirty-one eighteen um, is fifty-one million five hundred thirty. Um, and and we can reduce in there. We can reduce what we are going to spend in principal next year. So we can reduce that balance by the five million five thousand. Um, so to get our net. Obligated debt outstanding um, is 46525000 46, And that's kind of where we're starting with the debt limits. Um, so that frees up capacity of almost $20 million, $19,804,000. Uh, this might not match. I know talk, Doug brought this up um, in the auditor's report. There were some uh, kind of different numbers. A couple of changes from there is that's as of 12-31-2017. Um, that also does include the most recent equalized value, I believe, and it also, also there's these bands that we borrow for. I don't know if you remember from the last time Jeff was here, we borrowed um, bond anticipation notes, so basically they're like a three to five year uh, note, and we eventually refinance those into long-term debt. They officially are not um, 
counted against the debt limit. Um, but I do include them in here because we eventually have to refinance them, so we eventually have to count them against here. So I include that. So if you're kind of looking at where they're at, what they gave us, and match it up, it's going to be hard to match it up unless you include the bands in there. So I just did that because I want to be conservative because we will have to refinance those and go long-term debt, and they will hit the levy, levy limit. So I get, it gets us here to the um, debt limit unused of the $19 million, 804. Um, there is some required borrowing coming up in TIF 9. Um, we will be coming here eventually, fairly soon. We just approved the uh, capital purchase of uh, or the capital improvement for the street and parks. Um, we still have the shelter that's coming. We still have some other cost um, that wasn't budget for, borrowed before. We'll borrow at once, and there will be some capitalized interest. And the developers' agreements are in this number that are required um, to pay for, and that's estimated to be about $8.8 .8 million. That's basically what we have to borrow here in, in the near future. <coughs> So what's really available, and we want you to back that out, is the $11 million, 5000 5, Is the $8.8 .8 million all in 2019? Um, basically 18 and 19. So we'll be borrowing here fairly soon. And once the uh, two projects are done, yeah. which are supposed to be done as of uh, 2019, the hotel and the uh, uh, Dorrance project, um, then we'll borrow for those. So let's... Uh, once they're completed okay. and they meet all the requirements, we'll, we'll pay that next year. Uh, so the funds available, we're borrowing, it's $11 million available. Um, the, the budget is um, about 3.9 as what we propose. So these are about $7 million for the future use. Um, as a 2020 payment, you can kind of add that on to the $7 million for the future. Um, we're, we're repaying back $5.5 .5 million uh, in, in 2020. Uh, also in there, uh, I probably went a little conservative uh, with kind of the, what's going to come from the equalized value. I, I'm, I'm hoping Thorns project or the project comes in um, equalized value higher than maybe expected in the hotel, um, have some, some other construction. So that number is just going to grow. Um, so that's really new construction is big when it comes to equalized value. Um, here's our breakout of our current debt by each different category. The city is basically your general obligation, which or general borrowing, which is basically your streets, your parks, anything that's not into TIF. Um, on most sides, either going to be parks or uh, or these streets. TIF 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and 9. Or, um, so TIF 4, if everybody's aware of that, is we call that Monona Drive. That was used to pay for Monona Drive. TIF 5 is um, Garden Circle at MSP um, project. TIF 6 is uh, UW and Meredith Clinics. Uh, TIF 7 is Fairway Glen. Fair, yeah, uh, TIF 8, uh, which is Trista. Uh, TIF 9 is at the Riverfront. Um, and we do have, sometimes we do borrow s storm, we usually borrow general obligation, and sometimes sewer and water uh, we do borrow with general obligation. Um, but a lot of times we borrow with revenue bonds. It's based on kind of how big of we have to borrow for sewer and water if it goes into a revenue bond or general, uh, general obligation. Uh, revenue bonds are um, utility and water. Most of those are utility and waters uh, debts. We do have that debt outstanding too. And they get the re revenue bonds and the sewer, storm, and water all get paid through the rate system. Mark, not to get on a sidetrack, are we closing TIF 7? With the 250000 are we paying that off? Uh, so in three... So basically, you're paying about a hundred thousand, uh, seventy-five. Is it seventy-five thousand per year, roughly? Oh. Hundred thousand. So in about three years, oh, okay. we could close it off. Um, I would probably recommend right at that time. That would be one thing we can would do. Because gotcha. um, if you're going to do another project there, you just start to you know, probably want to start the clock over again. Um, this is uh, just. I think I should have put percentages in here. This is kind of just showing where. <laughs> All that we just showed, where all the debt is coming from, uh, of our outstanding debt. So the red is basically your TIF, uh, your general obligation against, which is your streets, your parks, any non-TIF, uh, fire and police. That is uh, in yellow, and the utilities, which is mainly uh, water and storm, is, makes up the majority of that balance uh, is there. So here's your future debt payments out to year 2025. Uh, 
as you can see, there's some larger debt payments coming. Um, we will be start paying back a large amount in TIF number five, which is Garden Circle. There's some large debt payments coming in fairly soon. Um, here's kind of the breakout of per year, uh, 19 to 25, uh, balances those numbers. Um, as you can see, there's uh, we'll be paying some larger sums in the TIFs in the near future. So that's our debt payments per year by each different category. Uh, so this is also on your kind of your page, this page one. Um, so based on this, uh, so general borrowing for 2019, uh, you had the general borrowing, which is uh, $3.4 million, and you had in uh, the TIF of 4 and 10, 4. 4 and 10,000, and then the storm 100,000. If you add those three numbers together, uh, you get to what affects the levy limit, the debt limit is $3.9 million. Um, is where we get that. So, so the total borrowing is there. So if you kind of oh shoot, if you kind of go back down to the very bottom, uh, the debt capacity, once you uh, subtract out, all that out, is $11 million on use of $7 million, and it kind of goes forward again. 2020, there's some large items in there. Um, we'll kind of talk about here in a little bit. Um, I'm assuming 220 and 21, there's gonna be some tough choices we'll have to make. So I don't think those uh, 5.8 and 5.3 are numbers we'll actually borrow for. Um, but there is some large street projects and some HVACs and some other issues we'll have to talk about if that's um, in the near future, if that's the, way, the route we wanna go. Because um, we do need to, to free up the capacity here. Um, so if you kind of keep those projects in 20 and 21, um, your debt capacity uh, does go down in the $9 million unused for 2020 and 21, $8 million in 22, it's $11 million in 23, we'll start freeing up a lot more, about $17 million. So, so we'll still have some tough choices here to make in the near future of our uh, borrowing. And so the potential borrowing things we have to look at is the riverfront, if there's gonna be what all goes in there, any more TIF, if you have another TIF that gets set up, developer's agreement, more TIF projects, future cap, uh, capital projects, any emergency that we needed for. Um, here's kind of the breaking up. So we borrow for one year at a time for capital projects. Uh, debt services exempt from the levy limit. So here's kind of where we've been since 2013 per year. You know, 2013, uh, I wish I would remember what's in 13, but it's 5.4. Fourteen, three point one, three point nine, two point nine. So uh, after thirteen, which I probably believe is Manoa, some finishing up Manoa Drive phase area between uh, Dean and Nichols, I believe that's what that would be. Uh, but you can see we're trying to keep it around the three million dollars, to, to uh, right around that area, which we've been trying to trying to do, and that you know keeps the stabilizes the debt payments too. Uh, so major capital items um, in here, it's supposed to be City Hall, not Hell, but Hall. So we'll talk about this one basically next Monday. This would be Brad who we're talking about this. Um, so 279,000 um, this year, uh, part of it's for engineering for 2000, I mean, 279,000 for 2019, but there's a lot, there's over $100,000 in there for engineering that it's gonna relate to 2020. Um, so that'll be a decision we'll have to make if we want to go ahead with that. Those projects. Bridge Road here is a two point million, two point two point one million dollars for Bridge Road that includes utilities. Uh, North Winnipeg kind of Lagoon dredging. Um, part of this is PC, the PC uh, B, uh, remediation. Part of it's just dredging the rest of it. Um, we'll get in detail to that the next meeting. That's with Jake and uh, Dan, both uh, on that project. St annual street projects, two hundred thousand. Uh, Riverfront Park, there's some cost of 385000 We put this in here and that's officially really haven't really approved the ice skating rink, I believe, and, and the uh, B cycle and the cart. So I put it in here as a 385 um, mount. So that's what those 385 is for the Riverfront. For some reason, here's the goal. Like I said, it's kind of out of order. Um, the goal was to keep it at $2, $2 million to exclude bridge rolls and tip that kind of we talked about. Um, <coughs> Before is three almost four million dollars. Once you subtract out TIF and Bridge Road, we're almost at two million. Uh, basically, one 
2.1 million dollars is where we're at. Uh, uh, there is changes. Uh, if you go to page two, there's a bunch of changes. Uh, not a lot of big changes, changes, but we did um, include some stuff in here from the different departments. Um, the city hall, the library, HVAC engineering, we did add about, I believe it's 101,000, 105,000. Uh, soft winter cold road up, upgrades. Um, again, that we talk about next week, and that's kind of looking at you know sidewalks, bump outs, uh, bump ends, uh, kind of the bike pad that's coming out of that committee. Um, what's being removed um, from when the departments, the committees approved? Uh, the Capital City bike trail was removed. The water meter upgrades was removed with Winnicott and North improvements and Huska Park, and the city community center remodeling plan. Um, We'll probably get in more details of later on why there was a cut, but most of those were cuts. You know, we're focusing on the public safety and the, you know, the uh, long-term plan here, so we're trying to make sure we got enough capacity for that. Um, you know, things to think about is the riverfront. Um, we had more into the public safety building, uh, so we just want to reduce borrowing for you know future projects. Here's some items for the future we, uh, to think about when we're looking at this. We talked about this HVAC, the, um, the 279000 that we have in the 2019 budget. Um, just in 2020 alone, um, we have uh, $716,000. Um, they stranded their plan. Um, you guys, the council hasn't seen it yet, but you will see it fairly soon. Um, but that's some of the recommendations in there. So that's. We yeah, had in the future years would be over a million dollars for this whole project for the HVAC. So that'd be something that we were, we're really looking at, um, see if there's a way around what we're doing. But it is going to be expensive. 2020, when I talk about there's three roads that are in there. There's Atwood, which is with a uh, uh, project with Madison, uh, Monona Drive, which is a portion of Monona Drive has to be redone, McKenna Road. Those three projects added together are basically $2.7 million. There's some bridge replacement that's in the two future years, 2020-21. Uh, there's water meter upgrades, um, almost 850,000. You know, Winnicott Park, we're still at 2.7 million dollars. Huska Park, 1.3, and Stonebridge, roughly 500,000. So there's some bigger future uh, expenditures coming down the line. Uh, but that's if you could that's Mark, it. could you go back? Yeah. Um, so. The Atwood Avenue project, I don't know, if we, we need to check with the city of Madison to see if they still plan to go forward. Uh, or maybe we already have with their own funds because they're not going to have federal <coughs> funds. Okay. Yeah, last time I talked to Dan, he thought that was a goal, so we can... They're still going to do it? That's what I'm okay. understanding with Dan, so... Well, we can double check for the next meeting. Well, the federal, they definitely do not have federal funding that right. ended up going to, um, well, more or less the Cottage Grove Road and, uh, well, not really Buckeye. Anyway, the, Atwood does not have federal funding. So it's a question of when, until at least, I think 23 or 24 would be the earliest. Well, that'd be good, because that's about 900,000 right there. Though. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, I have one. What was the assumption so you've made for the growth of the equalized value going forward? I put about, uh, I believe at 4% I put in there, especially with uh, for this next year, and then I went down to 3% after that. So 4% with uh, the hotel and uh, the river, other riverfront project. Um, so I did put 4% in there. Um, <coughs> If I did the math right, we had about 5% this year? Mm -hmm. Roughly, yeah. yeah. And that was what? Traced it? No. No, it was a mix. Um, majority of it was economic change. Um, so that would be just everybody's reassessments went up. Majority of that mm -hmm. and some commercial. It all depends on how, how much the uh, assessments are going to go up here in the next couple of years. If it just keeps on growing and growing, so we'll probably have at least Higher, probably higher than five percent after for next year. Okay, so it's a fairly conservative. It's a fairly conservative number. Yeah, which is yeah. probably the way to do it. Yeah. 
Anyone else? No. Well, thank you, Mark. I guess we'll move to our first uh, presentation. And Leah will talk about information technology. I think that's on page 23. And did you have that page for Jones? Yeah, I have it with us. She was last. So oh, that's right. OK. She's going to talk separately from Leah. Really? You forgot to put your page in. Oh, yeah. I see how it is. <laughs> You're just Jones. So. Yeah. Oh. 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 I can't see what I put when you get. She gives it to me worse. <laughs> we are going to miss you when you miss the video. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mayor O'Connor. Okay. Um, okay, so the city does not have an IT professional on staff. We contract with. Um, land tech services for our IT services and I act as um, sort of the staff liaison for all the departments um, and Sarah Lieutenant Sarah Duman acts as the staff liaison for the um, police department so between the two of us we work with land tech in terms of what they're doing what projects they need to do what needs to be added fixed all that kind of stuff um, we try and troubleshoot as much as possible before we have to call them and um, or try and troubleshoot things over the phone with them um, so that that's kind of my role in information technology so if you have really specific questions um, that I can't answer I will consult with land tech and get you answers for those um, the way that I develop the IT budget is um, twofold First, we have um, a pretty extensive computer replacement schedule that is sort of a living document that we keep and work with. Um, we have all the computer users in the city, so basically anyone who has a computer in the city is on this schedule and they have a classification of what kind of computer user they are, if they're a super user or just sort of your normal computer user. And then based on that, we schedule their computer replacements based on that. So. Um, that's the first thing that I use to develop the budget and then the second thing is I meet with land tech in each of the department heads separately to find out what's coming up in their departments um, what needs they have what's working for them not working for them and then we compile our budget so um, if you look on page 23 I have a summary of um, the budget items that we need so computers um, ironically is probably one of the least expensive things that we purchased in the IT budget um, we only have about six replacements for next year, so that's a total of about $5,600. Um, tablets, we find that as technology improves, we are just using more and more portable equipment. Um, tablets, iPads, our public works crews use tablets in the field um, to grab maps or get GIS um, components, stuff like that. So um, our parks and recreation staff is using iPads more and more. Um, they can pull up rosters of kids in the field. They can take the pads with them um, when they're on field trips or when they're out in the parks with the kids. They can email parents. They can connect with the office, um, take photos. So um, we have about $3,500 budgeted for some additional iPads for next year for public works and parks. Um, one of the big expenses that we have for next year, um, we have about nine servers in the city and um, we try and replace those on a schedule because they're expensive and replacing all nine of them at once would be a huge expense so we try and rotate that out um, and next year we're going to be in need to replace our police arbitrator server which is the server that um, stores all the squad video and body camera footage so cameras are great and we're using them more and more and we have lots of cameras in the city um, but the downside to that is that we have to have servers to back all that footage up so um, second big purchase for next year is actually in Jake's department. Um, it's a software purchase for um, a civic rec program registration system. So currently in Parks and Recreation, they use ActiveNet software to register, do all their program registrations for all of their um, recreation programs. Um, civic Rec is a fairly new product and it's developed by Civic Plus, which is the same company that um, that created and maintains our website. So Jake is really, he's you know, done a lot of, um, of background and research on the Civic Rec product and he thinks that the way that it will integrate with our current website 
will be really helpful and really useful. Um, you know, right now we have ActiveNet linked to our website, but it's not integrated into our website. This will actually integrate into the website, so people won't have to have separate passwords to go from our website to ActiveNet to register for programs. Um, and I think it'll just be a, a better, more seamless experience. So there is always a, a annual user fee, which is in Jake's operating budget. Um, he says the annual user fee for Civic Rec will not be more expensive than the annual user fee for ActiveNet. And um, the credit card service fees will actually be a little bit less with Civic Rec than with, um, with ActiveNet. So this is a one-time, <coughs> this year only purchase for the actual software of Civic Rec. Do you know when, um, I assume we had to pay ActiveNet for software when we started with them? Yeah, or he's been, uh, we've had ActiveNet, gosh, for quite, like, since, I want to say 2006, maybe we purchased that. It's been, been a long time right. that we've had ActiveNet. You, and do you know how much it was, by any chance? Or I don't, I wasn't don't. here then, but. It's probably roughly about the same price. Okay. Um, printers and scanners, um, we, there is kind of a bigger purchase here, um, $5,600 for a printer, copy, or scanner for the Public Works Garage, which seems a little crazy, like how much do the Public Works guys have to print and scan and color, but um, the downside is that whenever they actually do need to print something, it's generally a big 11 by 17 inch map that needs to be printed in color. And the only way that we have for them to do that right now is to um, print it at City Hall and then drive up here to get it. So um, it is an expensive machine because it, it has to be to be able to have the capacity to do color in 11 by 17, but it won't get a ton of use, so it should last a really long time. So I think it'll be a good investment for the garage. Um, uh, the outdoor pool needs another um, point of service touch screen for the concession stand. They have one, they'd like two, so that's a $500 expense there. Um, and then under cameras, projectors, and other, um, a big expense there, $12,000 again for Jake. Um, he is looking for cameras for the community center in Main Hall, the lounge, and the senior center um, because of the after school program. He thinks we need to have all of those rooms. Camerable, I guess if that's a word. He need, he wants cameras in those rooms for that program. So, so um, security cameras. Security cameras, exactly. And is the library a security camera? Or that's a state so camera? the library. Um, this was something Ryan asked for. He asked for a camera with a projector for the forum room, which is that room across the hall that has sort of the stadium seating. Because they do a lot of like cooking demonstrations or craft demonstrations, and um, he thought it would be really helpful to have a camera that projects so that the people in the audience can see what the presenter is doing, you know, on the desk. Um, there is possibility that he could get funding for that from the friends group, though, but we did put it in this budget just in case, so. And I did talk to them. He put it in his proposal to them yeah. last week, and I, I think they're probably going to pay for it, but okay. they won't be deciding that till November, I think. Or. Okay. Did the library get a new projector this year? So I know what they did have was, were really outdated. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Questions? Any questions? Jen? Yep. Um, the server for the CD, yep. um, when we get a replacement, the one that we replaced, do we get rid of it or do we keep that? No, usually, um, so usually we are, are just um, moving the servers down the line. So we get rid of the oldest server um, and then reconfigure the new server. We do that a lot with computers too. We Anyone else? Okay, well thank you. Thank you. Next up, community media, Will. So it's on, it starts on page 96. And just so you know, this one's not, um, paid by franchise fees, so this comes out of his own budgets. Um, but we put it in here still because it's considered capital purchases um, but it's not paid through general obligations it's paid through fran by franchise fees um, and before you start too this was a discussion we had and we met with will is we purchased all that stuff just recently with the, um, last week we had the the amendment with the madison um, closing the was it in my so we asked if some of the stuff could be reduced and 
you had a re you can talk about the response you sure. gave us. Sure. So yes, um, as Mark mentioned, the um, this is not this is all franchise fees, and currently um, this year the franchise fees are staying are stable compared to where they were this time last year. So that's good. Uh, they, we have seen a decline since 2015, um, but um, you know people have been crying wolf about wolf about uh, franchise fees going away for years, and they've never seemed to go away. So I'm confident that they will stick around um, and fluctuate as technology fluctuates with uh, media services, visual services. So. <coughs> We did just purchase uh, about eleven and a half thousand dollars worth of equipment from Madison Media Institute, and nine thousand. Excuse me, it was more about thirteen thousand um, from Madison Media Institute, I believe, and about nine thousand eight hundred seventy-five dollars of that purchase was the school district's purchase that we are loaning them for two years as they pay us back. Uh, part of the agreement we have with the school district is um, they will provide funds each year to help upgrade the AV equipment uh, to the tune of about $5,000. One year it might be 4000 the next year it might be 6000 It can fluctuate based on the needs. So we are going to essentially, through that Mass Media Institute equipment purchase, loan them the money right now for the next two years of purchases of from that five thousand each year. So they purchased nine thousand eight hundred seventy-five. That's two years worth of uh, equipment upgrades that they that we uh, are making with them, so to speak. Regarding uh, our capital purchases, um, our first item is the video storage video server. So as you can imagine, we, we gobble up a lot of room on hard drives, or a hard drive, if you will, or storage, because of a uh, high definition video takes a lot of room, and we do a lot of long form production, two hour musicals, two hour, you know, hour and a half choir concerts, two hour football games. Um, council isn't as bad because we uh, it gets compressed right away but um, we do a lot of long form things that take up a lot of room so we gobble up we gobble up space constantly the currently we're on our second um, video server we got the first one used up all the room the radio station came along perfect time to give that to the radio station then we upgraded to another video server that has more room. And we have since taken that video server and put larger hard drives in that server so that can take up more room. We're now at a point where um, it's not feasible or really smart to continue to upgrade that one over and over when um, we know we'll continue to need more space as we go on. So what we'd like to do is um, you know, get a more robust server similar to what um, Land Tech Services use for the city and all of all of our needs with with the thousands of documents in different departments uses, and that's larger, more stable, and can be you can add space far easier um, than our current server. So that's the biggest purchase that we we definitely uh, need to make. Uh, the next one's the field cameras, and we are getting, we did get some cameras from Madison Media Institute, um, so it is quite possible that we may not need to use these computers, or excuse me, these cameras, um, but I want to keep the money in there if one of our cameras does die, if we have to make a purchase because equipment goes down. Um, I don't have to come back here and we don't have to go through a, an approval process. We'll kind of just leave the money where it is and if we need the cameras, we'll get them. If we don't, we just won't spend them. Um, I would guess 
with some of this uh, remote equipment that we have that's now five years old that we've been using for everything we do every single day at the high school. All of our events outside of the high school are in the building. Um, that some of that equipment is going to start to to fail, whether it's this year or next, or next year, or 2020. Um, some of the some of the other gear, I'm just going to keep going, but that that would be the reason why I'd want to keep that. Um, radio station updates would be the next item, and that is we're going to um, we want to put some acoustical tiling on the back wall of the very small skinny studio um, so that it softens the room a little bit makes for a better sound hopefully is a little quieter for the other people in the main studio there's a lot you can hear a lot of noise if you're utilizing the station uh, on both studios uh, we also are seeing more traffic so we need a couple microphones and there's only one in there now so I would need a microphone and then we'd also like to mount them on the wall or something and have it just be an arm that comes up and down because we're lim obviously we're limited in space in that little closet type room uh, so those are some of the some of the items we want to do there um, it's possible again with the Madison Media Institute uh, purchase that we will get some wall baffling if you will for free they, they really have no use for it and they've told me i can just take it so if it works for us then i won't need to purchase that uh, and i suspect there'll be a um i mean i'm not jumping the shark here i hope but uh I, i'm suspecting that as i go and grab this gear from mmi and i know i know the people that i'm dealing with because i worked with them before that if they don't see a use for it and they don't see a reason why anybody would keep it and it works for me they'll just give it to me whether it's you know cables and maybe old microphones that no one uses or baffling things like that so i think we're going to get a lot of side things that aren't priced out in our purchase price that we're going to get just because they have zero use to haul it on a truck to a storage unit as opposed to just letting me haul it away type of thing and and the last one is just a video production laptop uh, the remote uh, productions that we do need uh, needs a uh, laptop and ours is is on five years and um, just getting slow as far as what we needed to do it's starting to you know give us a spinning wheel and things like that so we need to, to upgrade that so that we're not having issues in the field with our computer those are those are the 2019 oh. items Questions? Yeah, well, uh, how long do you keep the things like football games and plays? And well, we keep them forever. We um, <clears throat> what we do is depending right now, depending on what it is and what we want to keep, we we try to minimize what we keep. So we might take the game, the actual switched game, where you're switching the camera angles, and it's one one recording of all the of all the f basically what was broadcast we take that and we um, we might compress it down just a little bit it's high quality that can go on YouTube whatever we put on YouTube after the game is what we'll save okay. uh, sometimes we shoot some footage of the game outside of that that we might keep but we try to get rid of all that because that's the uncompressed video files are the ones that take up a ridiculous amount of space and those are the ones we pick and choose what's important to keep and, and what's not and i sometimes have disagreements with the students or what they feel is important and what i feel <laughs> is important but i i try to be amenable to them because uh it is somewhat of i i think of uh the community media as somewhat of an archival uh of the city as far as events and happenings um so so do you keep council meetings forever yeah yeah there's we've i mean we We've, oh. except the last, um, up until 2014, I think when I came here, they were all on DVD, and, and they still were up until we upgraded the room, but we have been actually been getting rid of them, um, getting rid of the DVDs past um, seven years. So anything like 2011 or before, we probably don't have. But anything 
2000 and well 2014 and above we have digitally and we'll probably just keep saving them because they're small files they're old uh, standard definition files which are um, just they're very mm -hmm. small because what we have to broadcast on the channel is standard definition that's the old square oh. right so and that video file is far smaller than a high definition video file so you stream in high definition but you on the channel you broadcast in, in standard, standard definition and so we just keep the standard standard definition file for archive purposes because it works and it's much smaller yeah. but um, but everything else minus plan commission and school board and council everything else we keep in high definition which is you know pretty hefty with the amount of long events we do two hours and more the Winnicott Park concerts and things anyone else okay thank you mm -hmm. uh, next is Diane keep going up and down here <laughs> and we're still on schedule Diane so. yeah and you always take such a long time <laughs> Page 87, right? Yeah, I'll pass the new one out. Thank you. 2019, page 86. Good job. The report was changed to $6,000 because it was included in Jake's budget. And Jake's budget is being combined into one. So they get changed back here. Um, we did redid it, but it did get changed on page five, so it's in the bottom. It's in the bottom, the bottom numbers, but just this one page right here just should, should have been six thousand dollars instead of twenty-seven hundred. But it's been changed. If you look at page, so this, <coughs> this is supposed to be twenty nineteen, twenty twenty instead of twenty eighteen. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so we're looking at um, two things for two thousand nineteen. Uh, the first thing, we're looking to replace our square tables. These are the ones that we use for card games, um, used every single day. And the last time we purchased them was in 2007. So obviously, we're going to order from the same company. They're high quality. Um, right now, they're functional, but like the bottom, I don't know, plastic pieces are, because they're flipped up all the time, are starting to kind of unglue. So. Um, it's time to replace those, so um, looking to do that in 2019 for three thousand dollars, and then the other thing that both parks and or the community center uh, in general and the senior center could use combined is this portable stage. Um, right now, we use a homemade stage. Um, it's basically old recycling containers and wood <laughs> that we put on top of it, um, because as our groups have grown, our audiences have grown. Um, we've just needed to get them up on a stage. Um, it's really cumbersome to move. Uh, takes a lot of area to store, um, and really, it's frankly, it's not the safest. So, um, Mighty Light, who also um, we've been ordering tables from, um, makes this portable stage, which uh, also has a variation in height. So. The other thing I can see us using this for is even using it in the senior center when we have large groups because we have a low ceiling. We can't use the stage down there. But um, this particular stage we probably could use um, for some larger groups so that people in the way back when we have large groups in the senior center could see an entertainer in the lower level. Um, in my explanation, I just kind of wrote, we use this stage for our holiday events, ice cream socials, Jake's breakfast with Santa, the Easter breakfast. So um, there's a lot of great community events uh, where we could use the stage. Okay. So and any, uh, yeah. The Jake and Diane originally had this split. Correct. Between them and I and I told them let's told Mark let's just put it all under senior center and so it's just in one place it's easier to track and yeah everything so. Anybody have any questions? All right. It's really a. <laughs> That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up is law enforcement and emergency communications. So, Wally and Sarah. Page 29 is the uh, five year plan, and page 31 starts the descriptions.
Showtime. Ready? Sure. Good evening. Um, pretty much uh, our standard budget um, squad cars. We need to replace two cars. Uh, for 2019, we're looking to replace the 2009 Toyota Camry. And that car is actually going to be repurposed uh, apparently by community media. And then uh, one of the 2014 Ford Explorers. Um, what's the Camry is currently a hybrid car. We're hoping to replace that with another hybrid. And in 2019, 20, with the 2020 Ford SUVs, they're supposedly coming out with hybrid version uh, squad cars for the first time. The next item is uh, squad video because we're replacing one of the Mark squads. We try to replace the squad video at the same time. So that's uh, um, with the latest equipment. And the next item is squad laptop and modem. Again, as we replace one of the squads, uh, we try to replace the computers at the same time. Next item is our taser replacement program. Um, starting in 2011, we started phasing out the older tasers that were over five years old, so we try to buy at least two every year. Um, since we've been doing this, they're now like on the third generation. They keep coming up with more improvements. Uh, the current tasers that we're buying now actually have uh, two two cartridges in them as opposed to just one. So if the first one fails or if there or there's multiple offenders, uh, they have that second cartridge. And the last item in the police budget is portable radio batteries. Uh, we're um, requesting to purchase 30 portable radio batteries and two um, charging stations. The portable radios that we have now have been in existence in use, constant use since 2012 with the original batteries, and now we're starting to get them where they fail partially through a shift. So we've replaced a few batteries, but it's time to replace all of them. These same batteries starting in 2020, uh, we're going to start uh, phasing out some of the older portable radios, and these same batteries will work in those radios as well. So that in a snapshot version is the law enforcement budget. Any questions for Chief Ostranga? What? Alder Um I just want to say I really enjoyed reading that you're going to be repurposing one of the vehicles and also the fact that you're pursuing hybrid options. Mm -hmm. That's great. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, it does, it, it does add about $3,500 to the price of the car. And, um, I mean, hopefully, you hate to be the ones that have the first hybrid police car, but um, you have to start somewhere, so that's what we're going to see what we can do. Yeah, and Will, since we are getting going to be, I guess, trading in the other car, putting it for sale at auction or whatever, Will spends a lot of time in his own vehicle running back and forth between the high school and city hall. So we figured since we had owned that already, if he could use it, it would be great. Yeah, knock on wood, it's, it's going to be over 100,000 miles once we turn it over. And uh, that's the car Sarah drives every day. And to date, it's been a good car. Yeah, so yeah. so to go two or three miles every day, it's yeah. less wear in his car. So. Any other questions? OK, Lieutenant Duman. This is page 44, Mark, is that right? Or is Wally going to talk about this? I think we're going to do a combo okay. package. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so the first item, this is for emergency communications. Um, traditionally, all of the contracts that we've had as far as software um, and things like that have come out of, if they weren't, even though they're jointly used probably more by the police, dispatch is also our records department too. So um, the costs incurred with um, managing our record software has traditionally come out of um, our contract line on, uh, on dispatch in the operations budget. And it just seemed natural to put that in the, the communications um, budget for the records management system replacement. So I will let Sarah explain what that's all about. So we currently use um, Uniform Crime Reporting, which is required by the FBI. As of January 1, 2021, the FBI, FBI excuse me, is going to require uh, national incident-based incident reporting. Our current record system is not capable of that reporting, and so we are having to move to a different record system. 
So we've uh, been meeting with the other groups in the MPSIS uh, consortium, um, going through kind of our, our likes and dislikes of our current record system to try to find a new system that will meet our needs and hopefully we'll be able to um, function as well as our current record system. So with that, there is a, a, an increase in price that uh, is approximately $40, or $40, I wish it was only $40, $40,000 more than um, what we're currently paying. And um, we're looking to uh, finance 20,000 of that for 2019 and the remaining 20,000 in 2020. And could you explain a little bit about the incident-based reporting? We're gonna get more accurate numbers yes. right yeah currently um if you have an incident where maybe somebody is is uh, battered and there's a disorderly conduct um, only one of those crimes actually gets reported under uniform crime reporting it's the hierarchy of the crime based on their um, requirements the incident-based reporting is going to report all of those crimes so you know, if you have three crimes you know as you're responding to to one incident, it's going to report all three of those crimes. Which of I think one. would be useful for us to right. have that information, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think it'll be more accurate, mm -hmm. um, kind of reflect what we're actually dealing with on a regular basis, um, as opposed to just the, the highest crime. Yeah. Okay. And this, is, uh, this project is gonna cost about a half million dollars. They're pro uh, projecting it to be $500,000. We are, of the five agencies, we're the smallest one with the least population. So it's based population based. So our share of that 500,000 is only 40,000. And what they want is they want half the money in 2019 and then the other half in 2020 because the RFPs are actually going out. The RFP is actually going out Monday. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they don't expect this to be fully operational probably until 2020. Okay. So anyone have any questions about this particular item? Okay, the next item is uh, MITEL phone workstations, and this is kind of a, a long-winded explanation to this. Um, since we switched over to the TriTech CAD, um, we're getting less and less 911 calls. We had actually um, given public safety two options for the capital budget. One, option one was to replace the existing 911 equipment, which has been in service since 2007. And that project would have cost between 150 and 250 thousand dollars with ongoing maintenance costs. Um, what we found is that since we've been to the TriTech CAD, we're getting fewer 911 calls because the 911 calls that they used to transfer to us before, they are actually handling them as call takers, putting in the information, and then they'll push the button. You get like this little tiny air horn sound that, that alerts dispatch that a call's coming in, and then the dispatcher basically just gets the information and then dispatches the officers. Um, we're down to, I, I have just um, up through May, we're averaging probably about two or less 911 calls, hardline 911 calls a day. Um, I should backtrack. There's two different kinds of 911 calls for people who might not know this. If you dial on your landline, which is a hardline connection, the copper connection through, through the phone company, it goes directly to the Monona Dispatch Center. It rings directly there. All the cell phone calls, which there are more and more of these days, those are taken by Dane County. We've never taken cell phone calls. Uh, we probably wouldn't be able to handle the cell phone calls if there was an accident on the Beltline at five o'clock with one dispatcher working if they came directly to us. So um, with the, 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 uh, the more and more people doing away with their landline calls, that has also reduced the number of 911 calls we get directly to us. Um, of the 911 calls that we do get, most of them are from, I'd say, um, senior centers, assisted care, uh, people who don't have cell phones. And of those, most of those are for ambulance calls. And if it's an ambulance call, our dispatcher can't, uh, they can't, they can get basic information, but it's something that we transfer to Dane County, and Dane County does the, the, uh, medical dispatch protocol screening of it because they're the ones, they're the only ones in the county that can dispatch EMS and the ambulances. So of the, those approximately two calls we're getting a day, a majority of those calls are being transferred back to the county and then they dispatch the ambulance and they notify us. So 
after a lot of discussion through uh, public safety um, and also the presentation to the mayor uh, in our we actually met with our dispatch study group too which consisted of um, Alders Wood and uh, the mayor Mayor O'Connor and several other folks uh, the consensus was that it made more you know operationally and financially it makes more sense for us to we hate to do it relinquish those 911 calls to Dane County because uh, we're just not getting the, the volume to justify buying new equipment so with that um, we're proposing that we'll um, replace the 911 uh, workstations uh, that are currently in dispatch with two Mitel phone workstations Mitel is the phone system that we use in the city now and we're estimating that project cost to be approximately seventy five hundred dollars and these are actually just the phones right they're not the whole like we just replaced the right they're not the actual tables really and councils right. it'll come down to um, probably having a monitor a computer monitor is there going to be a computer another yeah, computer probably computer. another computer but probably not one that has to be replaced every three or four years mm -hmm. it probably last longer and then uh, some sort of a device that they can plug a headset to or a handset would come off similar to what city hall has for um, I think Leah has one in her office and Aline has mm -hmm. one at the front desk uh, just a bigger box with buttons on it to call people on mm -hmm. but much less sophisticated than the uh, the 911 system would cost so maybe this is a good hard to point to interject but going back we look back at last year's capital budget in 2019 I think it was 2019 there was was budgeted to spend 150,000 on on the 911 equipment and so as you said I know it went through public safety and we had the the study group get together and um, it was pretty clear I think at that point with fire and EMS already being dispatched by the county um, that and with the small number of landline calls it made sense to make the change and also uh, should be pointed out that the police station will still be open 24 7 there'll still be somebody there um, the night the non-emergency number you could still call that I think all those factors together sort of convinced us this was the right thing to do but if somebody thought no it's not the right thing to do this is where a budget amendment for that 150 to 200,000 I guess would I wouldn't advocate for that but this is would be the, the place to do it we originally have it, had it uh, to replace it in 2018 but that was right when we were making the transition to the different CAD system we want to see how that worked um, we're following I guess we could call it the Sun Prairie model uh, they did the same thing they started with the TriTech CAD and <coughs> they, they uh, uh, found that they were getting so many uh, other calls were being screened <coughs> out that they switched and all their calls go uh, to the county now for 911 and we did switch all the fire 911 a year or two before right mm -hmm. wasn't that initially part of the it, study group it was actually just to have Dane County dispatch the fire just department oh, okay so right. we would still if it was a 911 call reporting a fire on the landline we would still get those calls and, and transfer those send to it Dane to County. them yeah mm -hmm. okay and we still what is the percentage of our calls to that uh, non-emergency number is huge right oh, compared to the 911 right. yeah emergency kind of calls so we did we definitely need somebody a and they're still dispatching the police yeah, correct so right. yeah <laughs> well you had a flight I know, yes. I, you know I just got back from Canada I'm they, must, <laughs> they really like me they like me up there and I maybe this is one that followed me home I don't know. <laughs> um, so the next item is uh, dispatch video system replacement and upgrades and um, We've, uh, the current video system was installed in 2014. It actually crashed in November of 2017. We were out of service for several months. I think it cost us about $2,500 to get that repaired. Uh, so it's just time for that to be replaced. Um, so we have currently around 51 cameras in the system, and um, many of those are, are still old um, technology cameras. They're not the, the newer IP-based cameras. Um, 
So the old system would be, we'd like to keep that on hand as an emergency backup, but we're projecting um, to replace the system with a larger um, rec a recorder, more modern recorder with larger amounts of storage, and also um, start going around and you know picking out cameras at City Hall and Public Works that need that are older that need replacement. The next item is a radio system update. So even though um, we don't use this on a daily basis uh, we're, because it's a communications type of um, system, this is uh, um, to, to use the fire, for the fire department basically and public works in their VHF system. Their, um, and it's, this would be a microwave system that would replace the <laughs> hard wires, the copper wires that AT&T is uh, phasing out. So, uh, I mean, they want us to go fiber, and I think there were some other options too. Uh, talking to General Communications, um, installing microwave antennas between the water tower, um, city hall, hose tower, and the south town um, receiver. Um, those are, for folks that, that might not know, we have like three, three hops to cover the whole city. So there's a, there's a receiver at the fire station hose tower at the South Town shopping plaza. There's an antenna down there that's a receiver. And then the, the main transmitter is actually on top of the, one of the water towers um, off of Monona Drive. And they're all connected by phone lines so that it picks up a signal uh, of, the, of the strongest signal and then it, uh, it transmits that so everyone can hear it. And it would save us money in the long run because we wouldn't be paying AT&T for the uh, full line connections. Okay, and the last and thing. One of the thing, I have a note here that Chief Eckloff felt it would work well. Yes. As well, right? Mm -hmm. The last item before I'm Chad. eaten by this fly. Chad's <laughs> oh, Chad, I'm sorry. Oh, Chad. That's okay. Just a quick question. Um, is there a, like a little uh, power backup in the event there's an out? I mean, I'm thinking that, you know, the one thing that you lose when you go to a wireless system. You know, it, when the power goes out, the old phones used to work, and wireless phones work, but these microwave things need power. So is that, that sort of, I mean, I assume things like this have battery backups, but I'm just wanting to ask the question. It's a good question. I believe they do. Our current system has battery backups at both other locations, too. Okay. Um, but the, the, it's not, it's, they're not going to be huge batteries that would last, you know, days. Um, I think we'd be in good shape at City Hall with our new generator. I, I thought Dan was talking about maybe a generator. I don't know why they'd have a generator at, uh, I think there's a generator somehow close by to um, the water towers. Right. Because there's um, cellular connections there too that they want right. to keep up in case of a power outage. So I think there's there's there is some backup power, but I can double check before okay. we finalize this uh, sure. the next meeting. Great, thank you. Anyone else questions about that? Okay. Okay. The last item is uh, the primary dispatch computer, and Sarah is the computer person. I'll let her talk about that. So um, as you know, we're a 24 hour center. So these computers are running and functioning 24 hours a day. They operate multiple police programs, uh, our record system, our uh, connection with the time system to run data on vehicles and uh, people. And so we've had those on a, a replacement every two years uh, just to make sure that we don't experience problems. We have in the past had the computers go down uh, and it's, it, we always have a backup workstation but it never seems to function quite as well as when they're used to a certain computer. So what we generally do is uh, we replace those again, like I said, every two years and then we repurpose that computer somewhere else where it's not necessarily used in a 24 hour, um, type environment, but um, we still utilize that computer, so it's not just going to to waste somewhere. Okay. Any questions? Guess not. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you.
actually starts page 36. start out with fire protection the first item um, SCBA, SCBA bottles that's our self-contained breathing apparatus bottles um, the life expectancy or the life on these bottles is 15 years we originally got these um, along with the SCBA the full packs um, in 2004 through a FEMA grant um, Doug had sent me something earlier today asking why not um, spread these over a couple of years um, purchasing them we get them all at the same time then we end up then they're all they're all due next year we can't uh, we can't use them after next year they're um, obsolete at that point so um, one of the things that over the past couple of years we have been writing for grants for new SCBAs we will continue to write for a grant um, for the full SCBA um, but we will have to include this budget item under that uh, because it's something that we have to have next year. And the, the FEMA grant requires that if you budgeted anything towards it, you have to include that in the grant. So, so the grant would include the whole apparatus, not just the bottles. Correct. Yep. Saying? Face piece, okay. uh, the backpack. Um, it, it, it would bring us up to um, right now we're two standards behind what the um, current standard is okay. um, so it would it would hopefully it'll put it put us in a good position that we we can purchase and get the full pack for the price of just the bottles but we we do have to replace the bottles um, at this point so any questions on that one it's not um, the next thing is the firefighter protective equipment, I believe. And that's our standard uh, firefighter prote protective equipment, our, um, our boots, our gloves, our helmets, our bunker pants, our coats. Um, it's the turnout gear for going into fires. So we, we, they're about $25 to $3,000 a set, so we try to replace sets every every so often every year so that we're um, we keep track of who's who has what gear what year that, that was purchased and then we um, after 10 years it's obsolete so we have to replace that every 10 years so each each set of turnout gear gets replaced every 10 years so question I had one about that this morning at the staff meeting the question came up about is it the FEMA grant some kind of a grant that April had applied for and there was, was a, that going towards some of this um did we figure out what that was that was for the CIVMIC grant right a CIVMIC, CIVMIC does yeah. a CIVMIC does a grant but it's a, a safety, safety thing, grant right? every year I know one year we the DPW bought the um I um flush stations uh, we have purchased I'm trying to think what else it's the largest safety equipment I believe it is it's to basically spend ten thousand dollars get five thousand dollars so we can pick an item and to get a reimburse for it so, so it wouldn't yeah. I, I couldn't this morning when I it sounded like you you would were planning on spending that money towards these <laughs> This, this is one. Gear, this is one that, that we, wouldn't really make we a difference could in this. spend it on okay. if nobody else has <coughs> something. Oh, okay. So we're not even if we applied for that, we could spend it on anything safety related. Is right. that okay? Basically. Okay. Um, next item is our um, radio replacements. So all of our pagers and are obsolete at this point. Um, are getting to the end of their life. Um, expectancy we're also looking at um, purchasing more of the um, portable radios they they go through a lot of wear and tear um, every day just the, the standard use so and upgrades into the system um, and we want communications is is a huge thing for public safety so um, any questions on the radio equipment I had a note. Did you say you're going to try to reprogram the older ones so other departments could use yes, them? Yes, we we've got some of the 
the ones that are becoming obsolete that we can reprogram so it would just have our fire channel and our DPW channel. We also are looking at, um, we think we can get a, another, um, I don't know if we want to call it a special events um, channel on the Danecom system so that um, it's, it's a digital. It doesn't have to run through our mm. system. So like when Chad had asked about the, the microwaves, if we did lose power, we would still have the capability of going, switching over to the Danecom system okay. um, and utilizing the Danecom system. And then in the, when you're not going into buildings, it's, the digital works real well. The analog tactical, which is what our channel is and our DPW channel is, that works much better when it's um, when you're going into buildings. So, okay. and the last item is the um, camera system for the engine two. This is the same system that we're putting on the um, ambulance that's being built right now. Um, it gives a 360 view all the way around the vehicle, so even when they're driving, they they can look at the TV screen and see their um, blind spots. When you turn the left blinker on, it shows the left side of the truck. When you turn the right blinker on, it shows the right side of the truck. When you put it um, in reverse, it shows the um, reverse of the truck. But when you're driving, it shows, uh, actually, you get both views. So you, it'll, it'll be a split screen. So you see the rear camera and you see an overview of the whole truck mm -hmm. as you're backing. So um, it's, it, it's what we put on the the new ambulance that's being built. Uh, we'd like to put it on engine two also, our two most used vehicles. Uh, I just think it'll increase the safety when we are backing. It does do a recording system. So if it isn't an accident, it will record the accident. And then we have footage of, of what happened with the accident, so. Any does, questions? Does engine two have any cameras? On it, has a, it has a backup camera on it right now, yep. It comes um, standard with the backup camera. Anybody else? Okay. No questions. <laughs> uh, on to EMS. Page 41 it starts, based on that page. Uh, the first item is the stretcher replacement. Um, that's our uh, the stretcher for our, the ambulance that's being built right now. Um, we'll be replacing, instead of putting an old stretcher into the brand new ambulance, it'll have a stretcher, a brand new stretcher in it. It's used on every call um, that we transport someone, and so it's you know as 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 they get older, they you know, they're a mechanical piece that gets wear and tear, and um, so we're looking at upgrading or purchasing a new one of those. Ambulance should be here end of October, beginning of November. November. I, I caution saying that because the engine took so long to get here on time. <laughs> the anticipated date is somewhere end of October, beginning of November. Okay. We and we pay for that upon delivery, or have we paid half or something? Or huh? that's Barry? on that's on delivery. Okay. Yep. We'll write the check when it comes. Any questions on the stretcher at all? Why is it so expensive? <laughs> it seems like a lot of money for a stretcher. <laughs> well, and, and it's, a, it's a power stretcher, so um, it has a motor in it that raises it up. Um, and it, and it's, it's got a capacity of 300 pounds. So it, with that, it allows, it, it saves the firefighter paramedics' backs because mm -hmm. it lifts it up. Um, the... A lot of departments right now are using, um, they have a, a easy load. You actually just push the stretcher up to the back of the ambulance. It's got hooks that hook onto it, and then it lifts it up and brings it into the um, ambulance itself. That adds on another about $12,000. So To the stretcher or the ambulance? To the, to the stretcher. Okay. It's, cause it, it, that's an added um. piece to it. I've talked with um, our personnel on whether or not they want it. Our personnel don't think they need that um, that piece. 
they, they would rather see the money spent someplace else um, rather than uh, the, the easy load. Uh, so we've talked about it. Um, and knock on wood right now, we've, we've had minimal um, back injuries uh, at this time. So they seem to be doing a good job of you know, using their legs and proper lifting. So. What? <laughs> um, we'll leave that one later. And then the, the, the last piece is um, the training equipment um, for EMS. This uh, is uh, utilizing um, mannequin heads that we can intubate. Um, arms that we can start IVs on. It gives the crews uh, the ability to train right there at the station during the day uh, to keep up their um, their skills um, on a weekly basis. And uh, the current head that we've got, the mannequin or uh, the intubation head that we've got, is about 20 years old. It's getting um, when you intubate it, you perforate the esophagus, which is not um, what we want to do, so uh, it's time to upgrade to a new one. So, any questions? Guess Great. Not. Good Thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're done. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joan. Oh yeah. I know it's just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's part of the IT. I brought through my the description. Yeah, I'm all over it. <laughs> Including an article and everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is this is a new technology that's been de um, developed by the Wisconsin Elections Commission to uh, create this uh, electronic poll book called Badger Books. Um, this will be, this will replace the paper uh, poll books that we have currently that we use. There will at least in the beginning need to be the paper uh, poll book for a backup in case there is a power outage. Um, voting continues when there's a power outage at this point right now. Uh, there's an auxiliary bin that ballots go into that they are um, not counted at that moment, but they are hand counted at the end of the night should the power outage not be resolved. Um, so this is, uh, reduces the staffing at a polling place by um, close to half. Um, the, big, the biggest benefit of these is the uh, data entry. Um, they are not connected to the internet, but they are connected to each other so that voter numbers are distributed in a sequential manner. Um, but the data is entered directly into the system by an election inspector or possibly by a voter. I don't have the exact um, process down yet um, for a voter who needs to register and uh, a voter who needs to vote. Um, the screen prompts the election inspector. Now I have well, it's flying. talking. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, um, screen prompts the election inspector on their process. Uh, ask for ID, uh, state your name and address, tells them what to do. Then the uh, screen is turned so that the voter can sign. Um, when the election inspector then turns the screen back and verifies that signature and everything is copacetic with that voter, a voter, uh, they click done and a, a paper um, voter number is uh, printed out that's taken to the ballot table just like now by the voter and they get a ballot and they vote. The voter's participation has been recorded then and it's done. No data entry by City Hall at the end of, you know, in the next following weeks. Uh, voter registrations are the single biggest uh, error um, generator and are in the process of voting because of the number of uh, fields that need to be filled in, the type of information that needs to be collected, 
And this is going to solve that for us because the voter cannot go forward in the process of voter registration until they complete each step correctly. Um, it verifies, um, you know, that they've they've got a proper form of proof of residence that will also prompt the election inspector to make sure that they are uh, taking a proper form of proof of residence. Um, the voter does this right in the regular lines with the rest of the voters. Um, voters walk in, there's no more um, alphabetical split of poll books. Voters walk into each station, whatever station's open, they walk up to it um, and vote. Absentees are done um, on a screen where the election inspector can enter each one like a screen full. And I, I have not found out if then voter numbers are generated for those ballots. But what that does is they're in sort of an in bulk process of absentee uh, ballots at the polling place. That is another huge log jam for us at a polling place. <coughs> And in large elections, we've taken to pre-processing absentees up to the point of opening the ballot. Um, that entails 10 election inspectors working a nine hour day to get those done. Um, the uh, McFarland has offered um, me to come and, and, uh, and with some inspectors and play with their equipment. I've seen it demonstrated several times um, and it just looks amazing. Uh, my concern, I, I want to find out from McFarland whether four at each election or uh, each polling place is going to be enough, but I want to see what she says because she's going to have then an experience of a large election using the e poll books. So I'm very excited about it. Is there any questions about that? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I have a question. Yeah. So I know that a lot of the um, election inspectors are older adults, mm -hmm. and um, I just wanted to know if you thought that this would be accessible to them as far as a technology or if there would be training opportunities provided for them so that they would be sort of yes. on and ready to go? Um, there will be less election uh, inspectors on staff than I have now, unfortunately. That's a, that is a, a drawback somewhat. But um, this system is very, very user friendly. Right. Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty hard. It, as I said, it t it prompts the election inspector of what to say in a speech bubble. It you know it has uh, clear instruction to the voter too, um, and it it's basically what you do when you use your debit card at a store okay. kind of thing. So and Joe always does lots of training. Yes. We'll do training, and I think um, I did hear that one of the communities that uses the ebook um, had they didn't have a lot of training ahead of time, but the election inspectors picked it up within like the first five voters. They knew what they were doing. It's very simple. So um, it eliminate there's uh, state statute was changed so that um, there was only there only needs to be one election inspector at each polling. Uh, station. Right now the law is two if you have paper books. So that's where the um, staff savings comes from that. So um, the process for the voter is the same and it's really kind of the way things are going. Everything is electronic now. So this is one more step toward that I guess. And um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. Every time I've seen it I've been like, oh my gosh. This is great. And clerks had quite a bit of input in the design um, of the function. And um, the Wisconsin Elections Commission continues to update it, uh, improve it. And there will be updates ongoing. With and you'll this. receive those? Or and I'll you receive them. pay yeah. for them? Or? No. No, they're going to update. It's not upgrade, it's update. So okay. there's no cost. And I think they assumed that these would last about seven years, each one um, could be longer. Um, yeah, there's not, not a lot of downside. It's just going to be the learning curve <laughs> for me too. So, yes. So um, you don't actually vote on them though, right? No, no you <clears throat> vote on a ballot just like you do now. Okay. And are they accessible to somebody with disabilities to yes. be able to use? 
Um, just as the poll book is now, if a voter is unable to sign the poll book, they can either um, make any kind of mark that they are able, their uh, assistant can sign for them, or if they are totally unable to sign, an election inspector writes in the poll book, um, uh, exempt from signature requirement by the election inspector, uh, by order of the election inspector. And that, I believe, is an option on the screen. So the, the voter is not forced to um, do anything they're unable to do, and it is a finger keypad or um, probably a stylus will get um, for the signature, so. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and it's not connected to the internet no. except for when data is uploaded? Yes. And that's, is that uploading, it's not uploading votes, it's just uploading who voted. Yes. Right. Um, no, no one's actual vote is connected to them in any way. Right. So you're, we have okay. total anonymity, yeah. right. and that is in the the voter machine. Okay. All of that data is yeah. is going to be that's a sort of the the <laughs> next portion of my request. Um, so that data is is there. The actual participation is what's being recorded on the Badger book. Okay. And then the last question: What happens if it crashes on election day? Um, <coughs> as I said, there is going to be. Um, Paper, there's going to be a backup paper poll books, okay. and it can continue. And we'd have, um, I assume, backup uh, voter numbers, um, and we'd be able to keep going. Just like now, we do have that system in place for any kind of power outage. We just keep going. Voting doesn't stop, so it will. Okay. It'll keep going. Great, kind of yeah. hoping it'll prove itself enough that we don't have to print a poll book because they're 300 pages a piece and we want to go a little green that you know it's kind of a waste but it's required now to to have a backup um, poll book so so that's cool any other yeah how how long do you suppose we'll have to have a backup for the paper poll yeah. book I don't know I mean I would think um, probably two years because elections there's only two to four a year so to really prove itself, it's going to take it a little time. So I would say that one. Okay. Sorry, to push mm -hmm. a little bit uh, further. So if it crashes mm -hmm. and, you know, you drop it, you could drop a computer and the hard drive is gone. Mm -hmm. And then all the information on there is gone. So does it back up throughout the day to like a modem? Does it so that if it does crash, you lose 50% instead of 100% or... I mean, I'm assuming there's a stick yeah. involved. The data is this. That's a good question. Um, I'm assuming that there is a um, M stick involved. Mm -hmm. or, you know, a stick involved that data is continually entered onto, um, and so you would only lose to the crash. Okay. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to buy the there's two versions of this machine. Um, and one of the reasons I want to buy the version that's on an actual kiosk that turns is for one thing, it's a lot less likely to walk out of the room, like, you know, uh, if it's on a stand, um, not that it's ever gonna be um, unattended by any means, but just my paranoid thought, but also it's pretty stable. So it's gonna turn, it's gonna turn, It's connected to the mm -hmm. kiosk and so it's not and it's a stable base and so it's not gonna it's not rat rattly or mm -hmm. loose in any way so it's pretty safe did you say they're connected to each other yes right yeah, so that the voter would be numbers a backup if one two uh, yes yeah. right. right if one went down they keep going on all the others and they don't like one crashes and the rest don't yeah i mean they keep going so. Yeah, I mean, one reason I just ask is because, I mean, I know the general trend is to go electronic, but with everything that's going on, the paper backup, and that's one reason I feel secure in our voting here is because we have a paper backup. And so when you're talking about not having paper backup and then if something were to crash or, you know, yeah, the paper whatever would happen. The backup generally refers to the actual ballot. Yeah, yeah no, and, and that's, that's the more important of the two right. things. Yeah. But. And I think we could... Um, yeah, again, I don't know, I don't, I, with the backup poll book, 
we would be able to continue and record that that person voted. Yeah, um, yeah it's really, yeah, the, the actual ballot paper backup remains the same. Nothing really is any different with the ballot. Yeah. So. I do, though, just want to mention along these lines that one of, you know, the two big threats right now to our democracy mm -hmm. are voting machines that don't tabulate accurately what people vote and then the purging of voters from registration rolls. Mm -hmm. And this is on the registration side where, or, you know, where you come in and you show who you are. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm you know, cautiously optimistic about the technology, I do definitely have some concerns. I know we have a great operation, and I know about your integrity, <laughs> but, you know, I worry about these machines and the things that can happen without any of us knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, so th I, that's why I asked about the paper backup, because you know, once you have that paper backup, at least you can compare what's suddenly on your computer screen to this thing on paper that was perhaps accurate last time. Or, you know, I'm going to imagine we keep at least one election back or something. I mean, it's important for us to have these things to, to, cr to cross-reference because in a world where data just disappears all of a sudden, you know, we have to be on guard mm -hmm. against that. So that's definitely a concern I have, but I think this sounds like a great way to streamline that process of checking people in. Mm -hmm. And Joan, then once the election's over, somehow you download the data about the new voters, I assume, or yes. dress changes or whatever, and send that to the state, the giant voter registration system, yeah. system which is the thing that's been attacked more, I think, right. than mm -hmm. the individual uh, ones where they would upload it, but you would still have a record here of whose name you had added to it, um, the, correct? Yeah, I'm gonna, I, I have to ask about, um, right now if a voter registers um, online through the WizVote system, the My Vote Wisconsin system actually, um, the only thing I get now is an email telling me this voter has registered in your community. Right now, because I'm a Luddite, I print that page <laughs> and, and highlight their name so that I have a piece of paper that yeah. shows that that person has registered in Monona. Because we have to keep a paper copy of a voter registration for four years after they terminate their registration. So you're, if you don't ever terminate your registration, we keep it forever until, you've, until you're deceased. Um, and then four years after that. So my question to, to will be to uh, WAC when I get there is, um, so now what about that requirement for that paper backup? And I think that um, I was told in my query, and I need to verify it, that I can print out still who, vote, who registered at this election. I can print out a form for each person. Okay. Um, Problem with that is there, there could be 800 forms, right? So it's it's not very green when you look at it that way. But that'd be pretty awful if we had to register 800 people in the yeah. election. We've had a lot of registrations. Couple hundred, yeah. Yeah, um, we've had 500. Have we? Yeah. Told between the two. Actually, we've had 800. We've had really 800. Hmm. presidential, yes. Yikes. People come out of the woodwork. There yeah. are many people who don't vote at all except presidential. Now they're voting governor too, so right. within the last few years. So it's anyway, um, but uh, there are there. It's change. It's change in uh, in going to a paperless world, um, and um, you know I, I just need to find out by law what do I need to do because this does affect that. But they haven't. You know they're all like, well, you don't need to keep those records, and I'm like, what? <laughs> does seem so, odd. Yeah. So we'll, I'm going to follow up with some of these sort of background sort of things. But the system itself um, just seems like a huge improvement, a uh, huge improvement for accuracy, um, quick, a lot quicker than two people trying to find a name in a book. 
uh, if in two separate books and uh, yeah <coughs> it's gonna be a, a big improvement and voters seem to really like it according to the communities that are, on, are using it well, as a longtime election inspector I think I can really see how this would be awesome compared to yeah, all the oddball stuff we run into. And yes, and the, the yeah, thing that we have with um, registration forms is we will actually have voters put in their birth date as 2018, um, not in, and we don't notice it, you know, in the in the in the busyness of the day. Trying to get a voter to follow up is virtually, I mean, it's very very difficult to catch up with a voter after election day. To Very make a change, to make to to make a correction, yeah. So it's really difficult. Um, people don't respond to letters or phone calls or emails, so it's very hard to catch up with it. Um, and we are still trying. We're struggling with what's proper photo ID or excuse me, proof of residence when a lease is acceptable but a mortgage is not. I mean, the law is so detailed. It's very very difficult for us to make sure we're taking the right document even so we do our very best but there's always a couple that slip through and it will also um, we get um, in a presidential election we'll get a Madison voter um, and so we need this this system apparently will catch that address is not a valid address for Monona so we won't have Madison voters anymore um, there's always like one or two you know it's not a lot but yeah. More than you want, <laughs> you know. So, any other questions? Probably more than you wanted to know. Um, <laughs> the other part of this is uh, there's going to be wireless modems installed. Um, this is going to be a requirement. So, because it's a requirement, I may not need the funding for this. Um, Dane County may cover the cost. Um, this is going to alleviate. Um, a lot of um, strife at the end of the night. Um, at the end of a long election, which Mayor O'Connor can vouch for, uh, it's there's a lot <coughs> to do to close up the close up the polling place and get all the reporting done and get the ballots organized and get everything ready. And one of the things that has to happen is um, the machine, the entire voter machine, has to be brought to City Hall as soon as it possibly can be so that I can plug in the modem that's under the counter that's the fax machine modem and modem the results to Dane County. Um, so they've got on top of everything that they're already doing, they've got their clerk going, um, guys, you know, and what are you doing and get this here. And th because Dane County now has a new uh, requirement that they have to have the reporting done within two hours of the close of polls. so. We have been last many times, <laughs> Monona has, and it's embarrassing. Well, we and have the highest turnout, so. Yeah, well, true. that's true, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's going to happen is this requirement is the modem has to be a wireless modem installed in the actual voting machine, and the election chiefs, chief inspectors, will modem right from the polling place. So this is going to save, solve so many issues, save so much time. It's going to be awesome. And the prompt on the screen literally is modem results. Yes, <laughs> that's what you have to do. So it doesn't add to their burden of what they're already doing, and it takes away the stress burden of, of being Jones waiting. Come on, come on, yes, being hounded, <laughs> and so and me being hounded by Dane County. Where's your results? Right. Will you have to have Wi-Fi access like at St. Stevens? No, it's wireless. Or it's Apparently, wireless, so you won't. That won't matter. They say it's going to work okay. everywhere. So, so it was going to be a little bit of a cost and to install these, but I'm hoping that it comes true that it, we won't. That it'll be paid for. In addition, the Badger books. There may be a cost savings. Again, they were talking about trying to look for a less expensive version, but um, that it, I haven't heard anything about it since. Uh, if it does, does come in less expensive, then I probably will uh, request to uh, purchase another um, another machine at each place. So, okay. any other questions? No. Thank you. Okay. Anything? 
Thank okay. you very much. You're welcome. Did I make it in time? Hey, look at that. You did. You're one minute late. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess we'll accept that. <laughs> okay. In fact, I think this, oh, I thought this clock was fast, but I guess not. Anyway, that is all of our presentations for tonight. So is there a motion yeah. to adjourn? Hey, Mark, can, could you email this out to the council? Yeah. Your this afternoon he did, I think. Yeah. Oh, he did? Okay. I, wonder, I don't know if everybody's going to be here next Monday. So just hit. In case somebody's gone. Um, just the process. We'll have the big ones, the big dollar amount ones will be on Monday. But uh, if you had all your budget amendments to me, for the, if you want them on the first read, if you can get them by uh, September 27th, which is a week from Wednesday, uh, that'd be great and get those um, to me. Um, you know, you can always wait until the very end, but also it'd be, if you want them in the package, we'd, we'd like to have them by the 27th. We won't be voting on it until the 15th. Though. Right, so if you want it for the first read, you can talk about it. Yeah, the first read's the 15th, or the first, I'm sorry. I mean, yeah. I guess if you know the amendments, but that's not very much time to ask people <laughs> to get people to. We can try to do it. Right. right. At least that's like two and a half days. Right. If you know the first, so, if you want it for that yeah. first read. Otherwise, right. you can still bring them in later. Right. Um, so, I'm sorry, clarify, the first read is on the 1st or the 15th? The 1st, and oh, then okay. we'll vote on the 15th. Okay, got it. And then we'll be starting operating. So we have to figure that out. I guess the committee, the whole, I don't, have we set those dates? I can't even remember. Um, set the time to uh, <coughs> see the dates. Okay, we'll need to confirm that. Okay, so is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned.